Please welcome to the stage Ginger Wersbanowski, Vice President, Intelligent Solutions Business Unit, Northrop Grumman. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes? So I have to start with a little story. It's kind of what I do. So I don't know if you noticed earlier, but I was sitting with my daughter. She's uh, 19. She is uh, just home uh, as of last night from college. She's an engineering student, so I drug her along. I signed her up about mm, a couple weeks ago. And uh, she's like, really, Mom? Um, but she had to uh, leave midday to go fill out her equip. Anybody know what that is, right? So <laughs> she's like, I got to go get this done. So she's coming into our community. Uh, she's going to do an internship uh, with a defense company this summer and then with an agency next summer. Everything's kind of gliding along. And I think I was a little fearful. Um, I was a little worried uh, that I'd pulled her into a community and, and would she like it? Would she, you know, survive? Would she thrive? And I have to say that uh, as she left, she goes, Mom, this was so awesome. And so I was kind of like, oh, oh, okay, good. That's great. She could, you know, she'll make it. She'll make it. But the other part of me is, um, is just excited because, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have all these wonderful women that have kind of paved the way and men. And uh, today we're going to be talking about those relationships, those, this last of, 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 the entire, uh, of the entire day. We're gonna be talking about the mentoring relationships between men and women. So whether you're mentoring them or they're mentoring you. So we have a unique opportunity with this panel right here and we're gonna be uh, introducing them in just a second to really talk about how that is valuable. Um, at Northrop Grumman, we just started this thing about a year and a half ago called Mark, Men Advocating Real Change. And you may have heard about it, you may have it in your own companies, it's a, it's a, it's a really neat um, group of people and they help men kind of bring that kind of necessarily, necessary inclusion into the workplace. So um, I, I just look it up, they have some really cool YouTube videos, especially uh, for the men in the audience, things that you never thought you really needed to know but really do. And so I just, I throw that out there. But today we're gonna have this uh, amazing panel and uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna introduce them right now. So our panelists today include uh, Tony Cothran, Vice President of Customer Requirements at GDIT. So welcome, Tony. John Fant, uh, Director of Intelligence Programs at Noblis. And Mary Legier, uh, Managing Director for National Defense Intelligence Business, Accenture Federal Services, and Nicole Gibson, Principal at Price Waterhouse Cooper. And moderating this panel will be Suzanne Kelly, CEO and Publisher at the Cipher Brief. So over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And I love the story about your daughter. <laughs> So wow, what a day so far. You start off with Sue Gordon and you're gonna end hopefully with some um, actionable items that you can take away and start to build a plan for what do I do with all this amazing information. Um, thank you so much for asking me to be here. I'm really looking forward to digging in right away with all of you. Um, so we've heard um, a, a little bit of an introduction, but I'd like to give you each just a couple of minutes as well to talk about um, what you do and, and then we'll jump into some questions about the mentoring role. Okay. So would you like to start off, Tony? Yep, great. So Tony Cotterin, uh, 31 years in the Navy as a Naval Intelligence Officer, so career, career Navy. I've been nine years now with General Dynamics doing business development. It was an easy transition. We do targeting in the Navy. We do targeting in business. It's pretty easy. Uh, but uh, ju I just want to just a comment about this and thanking INSA for what they're doing. But the IC, I've always felt, is rather special. I'm heavily biased but it's a really unique organization. It's like I tell my kids, you don't know how lucky you are. Everybody that's been in our house has a top secret clearance. They've been polygraphed. They're a special <laughs> breed of people. And this is a special breed of people here. And, and the threats the nation we face today requires the very best from our intelligence community. So you know, we need the best leaders. We need the best people men and women. So I, I want to thank INSA for sponsoring this because it's, it will help the community get the right people to lead in this business that's so important. Makes a big difference. Thank you very much, Tony. John. Hi, thanks for being here. And um, again, thanks to INSA as well, too. 
Um, so background uh, for me is mainly um, uh, mil starting out military, um, eight years uh, in the Navy in an in a aviation and an intel capacity, and then in the private sector for the last 15 years, primarily serving in the intelligence community, in the DOD a little bit too, but from a, uh, an operational and a business development capacity. Uh, I can tell you one of the things that I've noticed over many years now within the IC is the, uh, is, the, is the big talent gap that we face uh, with, uh, with skill sets at the C-suite level in the private sector, and then down even um, a technical level as well, too. And I think one of the main reasons that we often see that is because we very much focus on uh, recruitment in about 50% of the population that we have, and a lot of energy and drive focused on 50% of the population here without perhaps the amount of attention and focus needed to help lift women up, in, with specifically within the IC. Um, and I look around the room here and I see a lot of those great female leaders that we have within the government and the intelligence community, um, and look forward to help speaking with um, a lot of you later on today and being part of the discussion here today as well. Nicole? Hi, thank you everyone for, for coming today. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart, and thank you to INSA for uh, championing this whole initiative. Um, I've spent 17 years in the intelligence community, um, all on the consulting side, um, and at, over my career, one of the things that I've observed is I, I have always been kind of the, the only woman in the room, which I, I know a number of people have talked about today, um, but I've had a lot of great men as allies, this is part of our, our topic today, men um, who've championed my career, and I've always kind of wondered, you know, why aren't there more women championing for other women? Janice just kind of touched on this too. Why are why are women not being as supportive as women of women in different situations and, and propping each other up? So you probably see me um, at, at this event. I'm very big in the Women in National Security Summit because I think these forums are really necessary. Um, so we can all network, like Carrie's talking about with AWIC. All these forums are really important to meeting each other and figuring out ways to champion each other in our various career uh, endeavors. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Mary. Well, I'm Mary Legier. Um, for those I haven't met, I am a retired uh, Army officer. I served for 34 years. Um, my career culminated. I'm an intelligence officer. My career culminated um, where I served as the senior intelligence officer for the Army for four years. I'm proud to say I was the second woman who uh, was in that position. And as a young officer, as a major, I actually served with Claudia Kennedy, who was the Army's first three-star general, um, and got to watch her um, usher through and push through a glass ceiling that was um, so thick and so resistant to this brilliant woman, and came away from that experience um, uh, determined that this door that she opened, my sisters and I would make sure that we were prepared if the opportunity came to, to walk through it as well. Uh, and so when uh, Chuck Alsop, who I knew as a captain and major as Colonel Alsop, that old guy that was commanding that brigade, <laughs> <laughs> said, hey, Mary, you have some ideas about mentorship. Uh, because as a leader, you cannot develop if you're not mentored. And you cannot develop others in that next generation. And you cannot call yourself a leader if you are not mentoring others and, and learning, but also passing on ways uh, to develop and to help other people. When he asked, it was a very easy, easy yes. This day has been so incredible um, just to hear the great stories that we've heard, this panel at lunchtime of these case officers and everything they put up with to put themselves in danger to do things for our country and weren't necessarily embraced uh, or understood that commitment. That, that was 20 years ago when things were incredibly hard. I've met so many people with such great stories. The young woman in here, um, being in the top 1% of the age group here, I, I want you to be empowered from this day. I want you to understand that you are going to walk through um, and move through and lead BIC in different ways. Uh, I thank the men for being here because the women that have been up here have all said the same thing. When you are the only woman in the organization, it is obvious that there are men that just look beyond your gender and reach to you to find that spark of potential and make sure that you own it. And um, so this is a great panel uh, about how men have made this day possible and what we can do working together to make days like this a little less necessary perhaps in the future. Mary, that's such a perfect way to set up the first question I have for each of you, because you're right. 
I mean, I don't think that anything that empowers women is ever meant to set women off on their own path, right? It's about how do we work together better to be a stronger, in this case, offer stronger national defense of the country, which we've heard a lot about how much people have sacrificed for that today, men or women. So first question, on a very practical level, each of you comes from very different backgrounds, married with the military, private sector, um, intelligence community. You've each had mentors and organizations that have different cultures. But if you could break down for me who the best mentors you have had have been and what the characteristics or traits were about that that was helpful to you when you were the one receiving that help. And why don't we, Nicole, do you want to launch it? Sure. Yeah, okay. No, I'll start. Um, so I have a number of my mentors in the room today. Um, I have a lot of um, gentlemen that have mentored me over my career, so thank you to you guys for, for all your help. Um, I think one of the things, and we talked about this on another panel, that whole concept of imposter syndrome. Um, and um, I think sometimes, I've had a lot of great women mentors too, but I think sometimes we have a hard time coaching each other through that, because I think a lot of women really struggle with that. Um, they may not have diagnosed it, but they, but they struggle with it. Um, and so one story that I was thinking about in this kind of men as allies um, topic is I, you know, one of my mentors, there was a um, program at PwC a number of years ago where um, you'd be, you'd be um, paired up with your mentor for getting to the partner level and you would have a session where you'd have a one-on-one -on -one. and because there were a lot of men at the time that were partners and they were trying to bring up this um, group of women, it was, it was a lot of the women were paired with men. And so before break, um, you know, um, the person that I was paired up with had to leave the room, uh, went and got water or something like that. And I was watching everybody else. So I'd known my mentor for a number of years. Everyone else was kind of feeling themselves out. So I was watching how the men were mentoring the women. It was a lot of very, um, very softball questions or very generic questions. Like, how do you feel about your career? I mean, do you, I don't even know how you answer that. Um, so th those kind of questions. I was, I was just observing how else was going down. And then my mentor came back. And he whips out this piece of paper and he's like, all right, this is what we're going to do. This is the game plan. And he's like, walk, you know, he's walking me down through all the paths of what we're going to do. And he's saying to me, you know, you suck at this, you're good at this. And it was very <laughs> candid, it was radically candid feedback, right? Wow. And I think um, one of the great things that my male mentors have done for me has been extremely candid in a, in a um, positive way to push mm -hmm. me, to, to really push myself. Um, and not, I think to Mary's point, not put gender aside because it, it really wasn't a gender thing. It's about you don't see these great qualities in yourself. You know, I'm going to make you see them and, and here's how we're going to get through um, to the next level of your career. Yeah, that's fantastic. John, how about yeah, you? Yeah, I'll follow up on that. So my, my journey, I guess, with being a mentor is, um, it has been a little bit different in the sense that I haven't really, I've never really sought them out. Uh, specifically, but um, kind of gravitated towards them over time. And it was different for me on the military side than the private sector side. I'll say that in the military, it was usually men, because that's just what the majority of the population was. And the mentorship there was really, really focused on um, uh, being aggressive, forward leaning, passionate, and just powerful energy in what you apply to what you're doing. Um, the private sector was like that a little bit, but, uh, but different in the sense that there has been mostly women, oddly enough, where uh, I, I really took a, took a step back and thought to myself, who is it that I want to really surround myself with in order to grow, in order to identify my weaknesses, identify the gaps, and close those gaps? And it's not people like myself that's going to get me there. Yes, I could work um, hand in hand with um, with guys with a military background and, and things like that. But, um, uh, but I, I come from that world a little bit too. But what helps to close the gaps that I have and maybe recognize some of these unconscious biases that we all talk about is oftentimes working with, um, working with people other than myself. So, and I can tell you at previous companies um, uh, that I've been, three or four of them in the private sector, it's usually been women that have helped me along the way and women who I have learned from um, along the way. And, um, and the, the difference to me has been, yes, you have that same forward-leaning drive, but there's also an additional element in there as well, too. That, and and maybe, this, maybe it's stereotypical, maybe it's not, but just in my experience, that women have a tendency to, to not only have the aggressive forward-leaning nature, but it's also some additional thoughtfulness there. They, they think before execution in, in a lot of cases where men are generally, in my experience, a little bit quicker to do those things. Um, uh, there's a little bit more uh, on the side of empathy there. 
And there's also the ability, just in my experience, for more of the, the multitasking aspect of things. So a lot of the mentorship that I've received on the male side has been is completely on compartmentalization and laser focus on things, where um, women already seem, the women mentors that I've had have been able to do that, but also look at that in a multi, um, multifaceted, multitasking capacity. Overall, I don't want to put you on the spot, was mm -hmm. one more helpful to you than the other? Or did it depend on sort of the task at hand or what you were trying to do with your career? Um, it, no, it, it really depended on, um, uh, I guess, the, the task at hand or the subject at hand or what it is that I was doing. If it was um, more on a, um, a business, business mechanic side, mm -hmm. um, uh, it was one particular person. If it was somebody who was, um, uh, had the overall broader sense of leadership, yeah. um, it was somebody else. Yeah, someone who could multitask very well. Tony, what about you? Well, as anybody who gets to be a senior kind of rank, you didn't get there by being mentored a lot, both men and women. I, and I was very fortunate from for my first tour in the Navy and every tour since then in business to have a lot of very great mentors. But I think my best mentor has been, and model has been my wife, who was a Navy officer herself, started in the Navy. She was the, in the first, she was the first woman in Navy ROTC when they opened it up for women. And I think her story is one, and I've heard it, you know, a thousand times, and she's told me and told others, you know, the day she reported in there at Iowa State University, uh, the Marine Colonel got all the troops out there and said, this is Midshipman Sipek, and you'll treat her just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the way she got treated. And she never had a problem, and it all went well. And, it, and it's a lesson I inculcated, obviously, over time. And But she's been a great you know, somebody I could go home and bounce things off of. And, and one of the best things that happened to us, we were going through, I was going through the Naval War College and I took for the first time the Myers-Briggs. Oh, and yeah. she took it with me. <laughs> and we were sitting there in, in the audience hall of, in Newport and the instructors going through the, the we're getting debriefed on our scores. And I found it was a real wake up on how different we were. Oh, she, she was an ESTJ, I'm an INTP, I'm an introvert, and so I start to see these things. And it really helped me to start to relate and understand other people, not just what, what my preferences are, but other folks. And then I guess the last thing I would say about great mentors, uh, and, and mentor for Mary as well too, but when I, I took my first command, I was in Molesworth a few weeks before 9-11, my, my boss was the first woman J-2, theater combatant J-2, European command, uh, Brigadier General at the time, Barb Fast. Oh. And Barb had been there for a month, I'd been there three weeks, and 9-11 happens. Oh. Well, it's pretty intense times, right? And, and it wasn't about mentoring, it was about getting a job done. Mm -hmm. and, and I certainly didn't do everything perfect, and we had some intense conversations. But I, but I will tell you, there's never a better leader I worked for and someone I learned from a, a lot and have used, you know, lessons from that about how to lead, how to work, and how to get things done. And she was a, she was a terrific officer uh, and, and very focused on people herself. Mm -hmm. And just the opportunity to, 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 to learn from that experience, again, very focused on the mission. I think most, most of the problems and most of the challenges, if you're really focusing, hey, what do we need to get done? Right. Who is the right person to do that? And if you're open, to, to saying, well, this person can go do it. And I think the challenge we have, and particularly as leaders, is helping that person get ready to do that job. You have to let, be willing to let somebody, you have to give them a challenge, but you also have to coach them into that. Uh, I, I can remember a couple opportunities, one very vividly where I had this young woman given this uh, small task to do as we were bringing some visitors through an operations center. And she failed miserably, and my boss was embarrassed, and I was embarrassed, and it wasn't her fault. Mm -hmm. It was my fault, because I didn't take the time to make sure she was really ready. She just froze as she went into the brief, as young people will do. Mm -hmm. I didn't take the time to rehearse that with her and make sure she was ready to go. So I failed her in that time. So I think there's a lot for us, if you're willing to say, hey, what do I learn from my failures, mm -hmm. and how do I not do that again, and are you willing to receive the feedback? I'm a huge believer and we learn way more from our failures than we do from our successes. So it makes me feel a lot better about all of my failures. Mary, <laughs> what about you? So I'm one, I'm fascinated by the, 
the, I, I too am married to a military member, and, and at a time when men were uncomfortable in the early 80s, senior men or even mid-level men were uncomfortable reaching out to the one female lieutenant in the unit and really saying, I want to be your mentor. I had, an, I had a mentor in my husband who was a military officer as well, and we certainly didn't get married so I could have an in-house mentor, but he and, I, <laughs> he and I were experiencing our careers together, and I always, when I was reluctant, and you'd find it hard to believe now, but when I was reluctant to ask my boss for a little bit of extra advice, because, you know, as a lieutenant and captain, you want to burden your boss, he's got things to do, you'll find somebody that will eventually take you on. I always had my husband to bounce things off of to say, why am I getting this reaction? But my first mentor, and I, you know, my, my, my dad who is, is 91, I, this is not an attribution, uh, my, my first most important mentor was my mother, who just, I was her only daughter, there were four brothers, she kept an eye on me, she was one of 13, a great leader herself, a great teacher. And her life lessons as she watched me when I was in brownies and being a little bit of an insurgent or being a leader <laughs> in my school, um, she would watch me and from time to time pull me aside to ask, you know, and, and talk about what was happening. And one of her, one of my leadership principles is, is you're looking at teams, you have to look really deep and find the best thing about people so yeah. they can contribute in a way that's unique to them they can feel included. It can't always be about the superstar. It is about making everybody feel like they're part of it. And I learned that you know, as an eight or nine year old when my mother would counsel me and say, you don't like this person, you're not looking hard enough. There's something there that you're missing. That wisdom, when I think about life's leadership lessons, there was a consistency to my leadership style or success you know, in high school and in college, and I find myself as a lieutenant and people are listening to me, that I, I can absolutely attribute to my mother. My father taught me to plan four months of work down to the minute. I appreciate that attention to detail. My mother taught me to pay attention to people and how they're feeling and how they're reacting to what I'm trying to do. And to understand there's never going to be a problem you're going to have that if you have people around you and they believe in the work you're doing, you're going to find that solution. So I credit her with opening me up to the idea that if I was too shy to ask that colonel, that captain, that senior, that junior, pay attention to how they lead and then figure out what they're doing that I might find effective for myself. And then when the time is right, ask them for that. So she was probably the most, the first and most important. Um, and I do give great props to my dad because he's just such a great guy and he married the right woman. I give, <laughs> I give credit to my husband too in that time period where I wasn't confident enough to seek a senior leader. He always told me, if they don't agree with you, they're wrong. Because he believed in me whether he should have or not and gave me confidence to go out the door but also gave me technical advice on my career. But the leader that changed my life um, was a male, and he was a colonel that I met at a time when I was ready for that kind of intense mentorship, who literally looked at his entire unit and had tons of people just like me, but called me into his office and said, I am going to work you harder than you've ever worked before. I want you to be more relentless about your development because you have such potential, and I'm going to help you fill gaps. And he could be a miserable human being, which is why having a mentee tell him, you're a miserable human being sometimes, but I'm getting so much out of this, I'll live with you. Um, but he helped me see the importance of being relentless every day, of, of, of really thanking whatever believer you believe in for the gifts that you have and not being lazy about it yeah. or complacent, but bringing 100% every single day. And that two years with him, changed my life, it changed the way I developed people. If you look at an organization of 1,600 or 17,000, how many people can you impact by just getting at the level that they're at and saying, we're on the 20 yard line, by the time we finish together, let's be at the 80 yard line. We're at the 50 yard line, you're gonna score a touchdown, but I'm gonna work you harder than you ever worked because I want you to see that what you have to contribute is important and my time, the mission's important, it's gonna get done if everybody's working to their potential, but part of my job as a leader is to create the leaders of the future, and I, I was never the same after working for him.
that's a fantastic story. So I'm starting to kind of see what a perfect mentor, which I hope we can kind of get to by the end of this conversation, looks like. And part of it, as you just rightfully pointed out, is someone who's going to challenge you, who's not going to allow you to just surround yourself. And John, you talked about this. Find somebody who brings something you don't have. Let's tackle one a, a different issue first, and that is, how do you first get somebody to the point where they're willing to be challenged? They're willing to look at themselves in ways that are constructive but aren't going to destroy their confidence. So I think I can say um, in regards to my own experience and um, profession and a lot of the women I worked with, two of the things that are the most difficult to overcome are shyness and confidence, right? And they sometimes blur lines. So if you are an introvert, and it is kind of important to understand what your personality is, you're not going to be that woman who speaks up and raises hands and interjects in a meeting. You're going to sit back. You're going to let you know, the men or the extroverted women in the room kind of dominate while you're sitting there thinking about it. You're going to be the one to come back later with like, oh, I have 10 great ideas, but I didn't speak up during the time when I had the opportunity. How do you, as you have mentored other um, young women in particular, how do you address the intersection? of shyness and confidence. Tony, let's start with you on that. Well, you first encourage them to speak up. And if you're the senior guy in the room or gal in the room, you gotta say, you gotta look at everybody who didn't contribute that. You wanna go in, Mary's point, I mean, your job at a senior level is to grow leadership talent. Any business, you need leaders. And so give people a chance, expect people you know, to contribute and encourage them. You got to go offline sometimes. You got to get to know them. You got to listen you gotta to them. You got to take time. You have to be observant of them and read the body language. Another thing my wife taught me, you know, read the body language. You know, be observant. That's your job. Your job's not just to do the technical part of the meeting. You've got to do that too, but you've also got to know what's going on with the people in there because that team of people is what's going to really get you to that goal line. And so, but. But watching somebody and seeing them, okay, I haven't heard, I've been three meetings now, and I have, Mary hasn't said a word. She's been here six months. I've seen some of her work. I know she has ideas. You gotta go off with her, or you gotta get somebody else. Sometimes it's not you. You gotta get somebody else. Hey, Joe, John, have you talked to Mary? You know, mm -hmm. you know we need to get more out of her, mm -hmm. okay? That, I mean, that's getting out of the whole organization. Mm -hmm. That's great advice, John. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, to Tony's point, it's really about leadership at the end of the day. And I think that the most important quality that any of us can have from a leadership perspective is listening, okay? And it takes a, takes a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra effort to, to listen first, understand your environment, understand the people really well. And you gotta do that beyond just a group setting in many cases, right? So you, I think it's something where you need to take the time and take the effort to get to know people on a very individual level so that you develop that sense of comfort with individual people. And sometimes these ideas will flow um, a lot better that way. And people will become more comfortable with you. The people that um, you work with become more comfortable with you. And um, they also learn to trust you more as well, too, and share those thoughts, share those opinions. And then over time, you start to understand what it is that you need to help advance from their ideas uh, and their initiatives. But how, who you really want to work with as a, as a mentor and a mentee to help advance them along the way. Because odds are you, you're going to be around people that have the passion, that have the energy, but just don't feel comfortable yet in their respective environments to help push that forward. And it's a two-way street. We as a leaders have to make sure we help to extract that while they're trying to push that out as well. Mm -hmm. yep. That's good advice. One, one of the most effective techniques that I've seen, uh, first and foremost, if you happen to be the peer um, of someone who is naturally shy, but you know they're bright, mm -hmm. you've got to help them find their feet mm -hmm. and just encourage them and say, look, you, you got a great, great ideas. And the, the thing that I, you know, I've learned not to be shy, but to say, hey, you've, you've got to, I've heard us talk about that. You've got a great idea. Could you bring that to the table? Mm -hmm. But this boss I work for in, in Korea used to tell us before, uh, there was a great comment of, um, you better take notes. If I'm taking notes, you better be ready. Because at any point, I'm going to call you into this conversation. And he, we used to live in fear because he would turn around in a meeting where the lieutenants are, if they could blend <laughs> into the wall and become part of it, he would turn around and say, what am I thinking? So at no point in this engagement of professional <laughs> development 
could you fall asleep or drift? <laughs> what am I thinking? I got it to the point that when I would walk in the room as a senior leader and sit in the front, I could hear the notebooks coming out because they knew I had taken that. But what that does is there's an expectation mm -hmm. for the introverts who are going to need the most help to say, you've got a great idea, don't be afraid of it, is I'm going to ask you, how did, how did this, what did you learn from this today? Mm -hmm. And his technique of teaching the, the, the quietest to say, we're going to make this a safe place for everybody to get their ideas across, but my expectation is you have to have an idea here. Yeah. And so we used to take the lieutenants aside and just say, look, if you get panicked, just say, I learned about holism and synergy here today, sir, because it's probably going to fit. <laughs> but it helped me watch over time the development of the shyest, regardless of rank, or the most introverted, to know that we were going to turn around and spend some time focused on their reaction to what they were hearing and get an idea. And then you all leave, and there's been 50 people that have contributed to the collective intellect of the unit. And I thought, that's a really great technique, because I'm not going to be shy. I've learned to sit in the front of the room. I'm going to ask a question. But the most thoughtful ideas might walk out if this leader who doesn't turn around and say, so before we leave here, I'd like to hear from all of you. Yeah. And when he built the expectation that we were all to come to the meeting, there weren't cell phones back then. There were just notebooks. And you lived in fear that, you know, don't catch me sleeping in this briefing because don't catch me sleeping because we've got to learn something here today that's going to make a difference for our mission. And setting that tone and creating that opportunity, I want to hear from everybody in here, and I'm going to go around, so be ready. Okay, so that poor person sitting there the entire time, like, I know he's been calling me, but... <laughs> Over time, you could see the confidence of those people. Their minds mattered. And he had a, he had a saying, you know, rank, rank does not equal brains. I need to hear all the ideas from all of you. So let's get your ideas out there. And whatever idea comes up, let's find a constructive way to receive it. And then go on. It might be the dumbest idea I've come up with. Or I'd hear if I said something, goes, well, Mary, that's very interesting. <laughs> and then I know, boy, I blew that one. But anyway, <laughs> so I would give you that as a technique because it was one that I learned that helped me bring my introverts to the table and help them become more sensitive. But what you said, getting a leader to go say, hey, next time speak up. We have something to say. We're all listening is really, really Fantastic helpful. technique, too, for both mentors and mentees, right? Because everybody's going to, how many times have you been to a meeting and, and you walked away thinking, that was fantastic. Never. But I think when everybody's engaged, right, and you do feel like at least you're, you're valued, whether you're outspoken or not, um, is the start to, to creating amazing meetings and things that really energize and inspire people. Nicole, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to build on what Mary was saying. I think um, one of the things I used to do, was I was coached to do when I first started doing consulting, you know, people would remind me of how much it costs per hour. And I, so I always had that kind of in my head. Like, you cannot go to a meeting and just sit there and, and just observe because the, the people are paying money for you, right? So you always have to be ready with, with an idea. And so I would study. I would look at what we were going to do to the extent that you can in some of these meetings. You know, what is the topic? What can I add value? And, you know, the first couple meetings were a little rough because I had my, you know, I had my points, I had them memorized. And then, you know, inevitably someone would say it. I'm like, oh, God. Now, like, what do I say? now, right? But, you know, over time, you realize that what became an activity that you did before the meeting, you start to just naturally do. And so if you're an introverted person, that's just a technique to try to, you know, get yourself prepared for the meeting and realize that you can say something of value when you are very anxious about that. And I think something that my team does very well is we all, you know, we talked about trust. And, and I think um, also showing that um, we all fail. We all, I think Mandy said it before about, you know, don't had the most perfect point and, and ruin the opportunity to share a point because you're so worried about how perfect it is. Um, and I think, you know, we, I was just at a conference um, not too long ago. Um, I was just joking with this with my team and I got asked a question that clearly I had no business being asked. Like I, it's not, I'm not a STEM person at all. Um, and, you know, to a person on my team, you know, I'm thinking about how I'm going to answer this question. And to a person on my team, they all looked horrified for me as I'm looking out in the audience <laughs> because they're like, she's not going to know the answer to this question. <laughs> and, um, and, but, and it was one of these moments where I was so happy that we had that experience together as a team because they're seeing I'm not perfect you know I might have a fancy title I may have an office but I'm not perfect either and if we all worry so much about being perfect we're not going to progress in our careers and so you know showing that you're human and can fail I think is good too for building confidence. You, yeah, when people right. see that uh, as a leader that you know 
you don't always know every single answer. You're not perfect every single time. And they see the human person there. It makes people that work for you feel very comfortable. Like, you know, ugh, I'm, I'm not perfect either. I understand we're all on the same level here. Let's get together and share, our, share what we know here and, um, and work as a team. Totally. If I could just throw in too, like younger, when I was much younger at the beginning of my career, I had a job where I was an anchor for CNN International overseas for a while, and it's very intimidating to be in front of a camera, even though you're alone in a room, and think that millions of people are watching what you're saying, and talk about fear of making a mistake, <laughs> and you can't possibly memorize everything. But what I really quickly learned through making a series of mistakes and fumbles and misspeaking my words and not having anyone there to turn to to save me because you're by yourself, it's just that people do relate to you better when you're okay to laugh at yourself. You're okay to be like, oh gosh, I can't believe I just said that. All right, well, back to what we were talking about. Yeah. And, you, and you're alone in the room, right? So it's a little weird. But I, I do think the <laughs> failure, the failure is important. Um, so I think that's a great point, and people do feel more comfortable with you. Let's talk about a little bit of um, the elephant in the room, but maybe not so much here today. Um, the Me Too movement, right? Everybody's walking in the place where they work thinking about what does this mean for me? for my group, for my organization? Has it changed at all um, your mentoring styles or how you approach or interact with women in particular? Tony, what do you think? I would say it's, it's helped me be a little bit more thoughtful and a little bit sensitive because you see, again, we're a protected kind of community here. We, there's not necessarily a lot of ugly stuff going on, or at least not that I've seen. And so to read some of the things and to hear you know, on the TV and things just reminds me, hey, there's a lot of uglies out there, and, and there's probably some people around who've, who've gone through this. And, and I think the key is, how does the organization react to this? <clears throat> I, I was at sea uh, when in the uh, first few years we were having women at sea aboard ships. And a friend of mine, uh, she didn't work for me, worked sort of beside me, another intel officer, uh, but she got groped in the shower. You know, 5,000 people on that, probably about less than 100 women. So she got groped in the shower. Somebody flipped off the likes and groped her. <clears throat> yeah, it, it didn't seem to face her. She's a real professional. But she, I could tell and talk to her just a little bit. The way the organization handled it wasn't good. It wasn't as, hey, one of our shipmates got molested. It was, oh, we don't know what to do because it was a woman. Okay, and that's not the right approach. And I think we've matured, both all of us mature beyond that. Hey, it, they're a person, something bad happened. It doesn't matter they're men or women. There's a certain things that have to happen to that. And we didn't do it well at the time. And, and that, was, that was hard for that individual. And it was you know, not as hard for me, but it was, I was disappointed in how the organization reacted to that. So it was another factor I put in my toolkit to say, hey, if I'm leading a group, something like this happens, I want to handle this better than that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. Yeah, for me it was, um, uh, you know, I, we, we, we've all known for, for years that there is um, unfortunate harassment that um, can occur in, in a workplace from time to time. A until the, the Me Too movement and some of, this, um, some of these movements have started over the past, uh, I guess, year or two, I never realized how widespread this could possibly be. Um, maybe there was just never a mechanism by which to, um, for a lot of women to come forward and voice and have a voice there. But it really did provide a platform, I thought, for women to have their voices heard. And um, uh, when that really came out, um, it made me kind of take a step back and just realize, wow, I can't believe that it's, it's this widespread. Now, it hasn't changed my, um, uh, I guess, my, my, my mentoring um, uh, style or my engagement um, I've never really had, um, uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever had male-female uh, engagement issues. But it did make me realize the broader environment in which, which I was operating yeah. and um, ensure that I'm more conscious of, of things that are around and just maybe more aware. And kind of to, to Tony's point as well, too. Um, secondly, you know, and I was looking, um, I was curious about it a while ago, and I could, you know, I think Sheryl Sandberg and the Me Too movie they have online. Um, things there. There's also parts there where um, uh, where it encourages men to get engaged in these things, mm -hmm. um, to really show leadership um, uh, at our level um, to help drive um, the, this culture and th some of this behavior, this unfortunate behavior, out of companies and out of organizations. And um, 
I mean, look, I've, I've got a, uh, a baby girl at home about this tall, and I want her to have that kind of world and have that kind of environment in which, um, in which she doesn't have restrictions placed on her. And um, you know, maybe through things, being aware of things like that and men being involved in those things, um, you know, your, your kids will see you. Your work coworkers will see you, and they realize that you are um, making a difference. And, um, uh, and, and that makes, uh, makes a big difference both at home and at work, and I think people see that. Mm -hmm. I think the awareness part is key. That's big. I think men behave differently um, oftentimes in front of other men than they do when they're sometimes in groups with just women mm -hmm. or one-on-one -on -one with a woman. Yeah. And that change is sometimes difficult to detect if you're not exposed to it. I think overall more women were exposed to that kind of thing. So it was like, of course this is happening, right? Am I right? Show of hands in the room. How many think, of course, we all knew this was happening. Yeah. Right? But how many men were clued into the fact that it was happening and were aware to know what to look for? I think is an important point. Yeah, before, point. before you um, um, uh, talk to Nicole and Mary, one other thing on that point was that it made me realize that there, I'm going to have blinders on. Um, Tony's going to have blinders on. Maybe we all do to some degree. There's things that are going to happen in, in a broader context that looking at it from the lens of, um, of a man are going to be obvious to some of you but I'm just not going to see. And uh, me being aware of that, uh, having that awareness that, hey, there's things going on. I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to see these things. Right. Um, it's just helpful to know and keep in the back of Nicole, back of your what about you? Was it, did it change your style? Or? Yeah, I think, well, so it, it had an interesting impact, not necessarily my style, but um, in how I listened to people's um, discussions about this. So uh, you just asked the question, you know, how many people has, have, been, have had a kind of Me Too situation, and, and almost everyone in the room kind of raised their hands. and. I think because so many people have become accustomed to that, um, we've had we absolutely have policies in place, as I'm sure many companies and organizations do, and we've been very good about you know following up when people make you know, um, you know complaints or they raise issues or or whatever. But I think people are um, almost surprised that we're that there's so much follow through now that they're. Um, be more careful with their words. So I think sometimes where people, um, you know, maybe joked about, oh, that that guy's sexist or that guy, whatever. It's like, no, we're we're all paying attention. We were paying attention, and now we're very much paying attention. And so we need to deal with it. But also, we I think all of us need to be a little bit careful with with our words because it takes away from people that have really serious, like Tony was just saying, real serious Me Too movements versus throwing away a word to describe maybe what was not great situation. Right. But you also don't want to kind of create a culture of fear where. Men are afraid right. to do or say or interact and because that's just equally as divisive right so Mary coming up in the military right you you saw a lot of things I'm assuming correct me if I'm wrong that you kind of had to brush off and keep going forward as a sort of a strategy for dealing with that yeah and so I think um, Tony you were still in I think at that point when the ab when women came in in numbers and it really wasn't large numbers and we didn't prepare the total force for the impacts of those things, and we didn't have the language uh, to describe it, and we didn't we didn't prepare the services for racial integration. We didn't prepare the services proactively for gender integration. One of the things that we can take some pride in is when the rules on um, the, the 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 ban against homosexuality was lifted. We spent a year or so ensuring that when we talk about dignity and respect for all service members, we mean it. We're behind it. There is not a side comment. This is a fellow service member that you are going to treat. You have personal, religious, whatever beliefs you have, we are now inside the United States Armed Forces and these people are equal. That is a reaction to how badly we did it mm -hmm. as we did racial integration in the 50s and then really gender integration in the 70s and 80s. So the Me Too movement took a lot of us back to the Aberdeen and tailhook scandals, mm -hmm. where the reaction of the men as the sexual harassment training and assault training came down was, ah, oh, mm -hmm. and now we have to be sensitive around women. That wasn't the reaction that we were looking for. What we were looking for is this is a small percentage. Let's take ownership and believe in our values in terms of how we treat other people with dignity and respect. Let's get on the side of the angels on this because it's most of us. This kind of behavior is what inspires teamwork of people looking out for each other as fellow soldiers, men or women, fellow service members. It's not protecting the man or woman that are using their position to make the lives of those people they lead or are led by miserable. 
And so we went through that as a service. And then as you watch more women come into the workforce and into the services to say, you know, 99% of the men in here get it, that this is a team and a team works together and it is not pejorative toward one another and it shows respect and that inclusiveness is important to our mission of combat effectiveness. Um, but let's start addressing the 10% that don't get it. Mm -hmm. men and women. I don't care where you've come from. I don't know what your background is, but when you come into our service, we have an expectation that the sons and daughters that are our responsibility are going to have an inspiring experience. Right. So get with the program. And so we watched, as, as someone that left the service you know, about two years ago, I watched this and said, this awakening is important. I had no idea. You know, you hear stories about Hollywood. You hear stories about other sectors. You see it in business mm -hmm. where there are no women. And I can walk in and spot it mm -hmm. where you guys would be helped by the other 50% of the population helping you think differently. Mm -hmm. You would also be helped to know that when your daughters come to work on Take Your Daughters to Work, she sees a place for herself. Mm -hmm. What do you say to your daughter when you have a work environment where women aren't welcome? And so I think we, I saw that as somebody that has been through it with my own institution, an institution which continues to work at getting better at it. What I didn't see the second time was a retraction of our male saying, we're not going to mentor a woman. We're going to be afraid of that. It was, no, we're going to continue to do the right thing. These are leaders, men and women. We're going we're gonna to do the right things. We're going to continue to recognize we can't just mentor people who look like us because that means service members of color and service members of, of different genders who don't look like us, who don't come like us, are not going to be leaders of the future. And that's where this Me Too movement needs to go next. In each sector that is still grappling with their own honest appraisal of, is there a power play problem because there's a, a gender inequity? You know, I came to the intelligence, the sector, you know, industry, I was very specific in what I was looking for. One, my general experience with industry as a senior leader is always going to be good, right? Because if you have billions of dollars, people <laughs> treat you great. Um, but I also looked for companies where those principles were important, mm -hmm. where it wasn't just we say it because we've got human resources people saying it, but you get a feel for companies in this industry who work in the intelligence community who are committed to inclusion and diversity. And I, you know, I, I, I work for Accenture. They have a very broad goal globally to be 50% gender diverse by 2025. Mm -hmm. They're serious about this. They're not serious about it just because it's the right thing to do, but from a bottom line perspective, the diversity that is necessary to lead this through this world with these challenges is to employ the best people in the population. And for the countries that are still struggling whether women should drive or whether women should work, well, I don't worry about us falling behind them because we have at least got that right. So I would just encourage all of us to reflect on what Me Too means to this generation. There is an open dialogue now going on where women who, and men who have been victimized are being believed. Yeah. The he said, she said, yeah. she said, he said, the assumption is something happened, and let's deal with that pain, and let's find those leaders, and let's either eliminate them from the scene or help them evolve. And that's a major shift. That's a major shift. I, I love your message as well, that despite the failures or the scandals that get the attention for a few minutes, instead of just responding to that, you're doubling down on the mission and the core values of the organization, whether it's your company or whether it's the, the military, that you're saying our mission hasn't changed just because this happened. I think that's a huge. In the media, we tend to gravitate toward the things that happened because it's far more sexy and interesting and makes a better story, but it's not what's going to get you to becoming a better organization. But, I think I, that's a great point. I think that's how you solve the problem. You got to focus on the mission. You got to go back to your core values and your principles. That's how you see a path to get through this yeah, every and time. Stick to it. So I'm going to open up for questions in a second. So I'm going to give everybody just a, a chance to kind of gather a question and then raise your hand and we'll, we'll let you take the floor. But I also want to just challenge everyone and then we'll have a quick discussion about it here. Um, to In front of you on a piece of paper, take a pen. One of the things that I did when I was at CNN is went through this great 
program that was meant to identify leaders and help bring you up and find mentors. And it was never um, told to us to go find one person, which is very difficult to do. And this is picking up what we've heard every single one of you say so far today. You need to kind of understand your own strengths and weaknesses a little bit and put together your own board of directors. So what I'd like <coughs> you to do is just jot down on a piece of paper who are the four or five people you would choose. Some of them might work with you. Some of them might be outside your organization, family, friends, whoever it would be, who you feel like would round you out as a person um, with skill sets that you lack or you need, who'd be able to support you, to challenge you, the things that we talked about are important in a mentor, who are those five people? And what I'm hoping is by the end of this panel, this will become the beginning of your own personal action plan. So if you are going to add to this action plan, um, now we're kind of getting a sense of who we are, strengths, weaknesses. You've given us a great blueprint for how to put something together that we can act on. What are either the pitfalls that we need to be careful of when thinking about how to um, implement some of these things we've talked about today in being a mentor? Or what are some of the opportunities that are often missed for mentees um, in finding a mentor? Because I love, and I'll just pick up by the simple fact of saying, don't find someone who's just like you. Mm -hmm. Right, right. What do you think, Tony? Well, one thing is finding somebody and then having a schedule with them. And somebody told me that one of the best things that happened to them was that their senior, that they, their mentor, had it put on their calendar. So it was a regularly scheduled thing. That It's very good to do that. And the expectation when I've been a mentor is that you come in with something to talk about. Uh, and I try to come with some lessons to impart. But I think it's very important to do that. The other thing I, I uh, point I wanted to make, is, and I think men are very bad about this, we don't compliment people enough. Uh, and, and I've been coached by some good women colleagues, hey, you need to compliment so-and-so. You know, she's, you, you didn't compliment her. You had this opportunity. I said, ah, you know, because she delivered a great product or a great briefing. And I said, yep, and just forget about it and go on, because I'm on to the next problem. And, and some very good coaching from a good friend. Hey, you missed an opportunity, so I have to go back, you know, and really compliment a young because person. Because you're encouraging them. Because you're encouraging right. them, and it's not I don't appreciate it. And I get this from my wife, who says I'm just insensitive, and I'm just ignorant, and I just don't pay attention sometimes. <laughs> That's every marriage, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it goes back to that, you, you know, part of your job as a leader is to be aware. And it's not just getting the task done. Okay, I got this done, got it signed, and we're good to go. Right. It's, it's I need to go back and thank that person for doing a great job. Because yeah. that's part of building that confidence to get to the next level. Bergman, I love that. John, what do you think? Yeah, so what I would say is that, um, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of times when you try to establish that mentor and mentee relationship, you want to make sure that it's a, it, it is a fulfilling one. One thing that I want to say, and just kind of at a broad level, um, especially to um, uh, the younger women in, in the audience, you know, you all are, I mean, the theme of what we have here, empowering women, engaging men, you are right now empowered. You are strong. You are powerful. You just make sure that you also have the confidence to realize that and understand the value that you bring to this community um, uh, and to all these organizations as a whole. Um, on, on the note of value, when you start to have that mentor-mentee relationship, realize that you are bringing significant value to that discussion as well, too. Oftentimes, you want to uh, en engage with um, uh, senior leaders, whether it be men or women, and, um, uh, and have so you can get their advice. They kind of help you along and guide you along the way. From a mentor's perspective, understand that we are learning a lot from all of you. Um, usually it's from, and I was talking to some, mm -hmm. um, uh, some young people here, younger people here today, and um, the amount of information that they were aware of, just from a, a technology standpoint, from an innovation standpoint, um, was more, more than what I had. And I had um, 15, 20 years more experience than they did. So understand the value that you bring, understand that it's a two-way street, and that you, in many cases, may be delivering more value to the mentor, or an equal amount of value to the mentor, that, than you are getting um, as well, too. So um, uh, take advantage of that. Great point. And we don't think about it that way. I know. Yeah. We always think about we're the needy ones who need help, not, wait a minute, maybe uh, we're bringing contributing something to too. that relationship. Yeah. I always got far more from my mentees than I think I gave them. Yeah. <laughs> we're happy to. 
Nicole, what do you think? I love that you asked everyone to take out the piece of paper and write down the names, because I think um, that's really important. I have my own kind of kitchen cabinet, um, because I think it's a, it's a lot to ask of one mentor, you know, uh, all the have all the answers of, of what you need. You need people to kind of balance you out in different parts of your life. And I think, just like you're saying, John, it's, it's not just up. I think earlier in my career, I thought I needed mentors above me. They all had to be more senior. But I think having, you know, just again, like wide, up, down, across, uh, you know, it's all very helpful for what you need to do in your career. Um, and then I think Tony hit on this a little bit too. When you go to meet with the mentors, um, I mean, I've been flattered where people have come to my office and, and asked for, for a mentoring session, and I get stressed about it sometimes because I'm like, what is it that they want? What is the topic? Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that you can um, say to them, hey, I, I'm really interested in X, Y, and Z, um, I think you'll just have a more productive conversation. I mean, I try to be helpful in those situations where it's broad brush, but um, you, know, you really help them to be more specific and exacting, and you'll probably get more out of the experience. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Something I learned the hard way, too. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want me to come in your office and just complain about how much I don't like things? <laughs> that's fine for me, but you're absolutely right. If you go in there with a targeted idea of what you want to talk about and discuss, you know what the problem is, much more organized. Yeah. I like that. Mary, what do you I, I want to make two points, because I think I want to agree with everything. I, I see the peer mentor, having a peer that you're completely comfortable with, who you admire, who's managing themselves, who can give you insight. You know, I have a friend that holds me accountable for every job that I almost talk myself out of. And that's kind of her job, is if I call her and oh, I just don't know if I got it. You know, she's yeah. like, oh. and, I do, and she does the same. And we've been doing this for each other since we were 21. Wow. And because we sat in the front row at MI Officer Basic together and we realized we take things seriously and we have been holding each other responsible. And there couldn't be two more different people, but you know, I'm so proud of her success and she's proud of mine, but we literally, when we're not going to apply for something or we don't think we're capable, there's, there is a peer that will walk you through this to say, okay, let me remind you about who you are and, and what, what we need you to do. Um, the other thing is, um, I had this great mentor that I had. I had to negotiate with him. And I always have this conversation with the people who come to me for mentorship. I always tell them that, look, up to this point, you have literally driven the car that is your life and done really well. And you're in front of me because you're continuing on that journey. And I'm going to listen and I'll share everything I can that might help you and give you things to think about. But if we're talking about a decision that you're going to make and you take the absolute opposite advice of what I might suggest is good, I want you to know that I'm going to be cheering for you. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that this is your life and I'm here to facilitate it. I'm not here for you to worry about what my impression is going to be. In fact, I want your mind to be strong enough that this is your journey that you're on and I'm just one person lucky enough to be here to help and maybe give you a perspective or a couple things to look out for. And I had to think about that because what I experienced with a few mentors is Here's Mary, what I think you should do. Yeah. And instinctively, I knew, it, even, you know, my mother used to tell me, look, you stopped asking for direction at seven. You just <laughs> brought home permission <laughs> slips and said, you told me to join, I'm joining. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to have, I want to own the decisions I make and I want to live with the mistakes that I make, but I'll seek to be as informed as I can. But when I had to make decisions that my mentors didn't agree with, mm -hmm. You know, a couple of them got mad at me, and I thought that's actually not the right response. The right response is you've taught me to be a strong thinker, and so I learned from that. Being a mentee, having mentors that that mean so much to me. When I took a different path, I like to give my mentees that safety valve, and we have that conversation at the beginning, where I said, "Look, we're going to have a conversation. You need advice about a, a, a fork in the road that you're meeting." Let's talk about the options you thought are important and why. Let's kind of sound, get that all out. And then, then I want you to go away and make a decision, but I'm not going to give you the answer. If you want the answer that I do, I'll give it to you. But you have to know, whatever decision you make, I am honored that you are including me in your life, and I'm going to cheer for you. You know, unless you kill someone or you end up <laughs> in jail, I'm going to cheer for this journey that you're on because it's true to who you are and it's what you think is necessary. And I think that's a huge thing for mentors and mentees to get straight from the start so that it really can be a two-way street. And if you make a mistake, I'm not going to abandon you. Ah, it's because like, how okay. many of us have that fear that if I make a mistake, everyone's going to abandon me, yeah. right? So we're afraid to try something that maybe hasn't been done before. 
This is a really great point. <coughs> All right, people, I'm turning it over to you. Like, what questions do you have? When you're looking at that list of people in front of you, too, one, one sort of thing to add on to that that we've, we talked about that came out of this last answer, think about people who would also enjoy spending time with each other. Right, so I looked at the vast organization that I was working for across different areas, and I thought, oh, I know this personality, I know this skill set, I know that they have, you know, a love for the Beatles in common, in one case, funny enough. Find things that are gonna wanna bring people together. I've got um, two people on the board of my company, and I learn a lot from both of them. One is General Hayden who all of you know, um, and the other is Thomas Tall, who is um, a part owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be perfect because General Hayden hasn't missed a Pittsburgh Steelers game, I think, in like 87 years or something, I don't know. <laughs> so, and it's fun. It, it kind of creates an environment where people enjoy exchanging, they learn from each other, and it doesn't matter what level, but look at the list of names that you wrote down and think about how they might interact because the other point that came up that I completely agree with is get it on the calendar. Right, so there should be certain times where you can ask those people, will you once a quarter or once a month just agree to a conference call if there's a reason why you can't sit at the same table together? And then also know that there's a two-pronged strategy. Get them together and then don't be afraid to approach them one-on-one. -on -one. Would you agree that that's? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so questions. Let's talk about the not be shy part. Right back here. And tell, it, tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Lauren Helinski. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. And uh, I know the panel touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you might have more specific advice for a junior employee who's looking to make that initial approach to a potential mentor, uh, maybe has their notes together, but is getting nervous about actually doing it. Great question, because we've all been there. Mary, what do you think? I just send an email. I mean, 90% of the people, and I, you know, so I was telling, somebody asked me, uh, how do you spend time? And I get tons of emails, because I really am open to it, of I could, you know, I'm a, I'm a college student, and I'm interested in the IC. And I may not be the perfect mentor for you, because I might have a little too much distance, but send an email, and we'll figure it out. And then it might be, OK, this person's going to be perfect for you, or let's work together till we know a little bit more about each other, and maybe I am your perfect mentor. But send an email, and you, know, and you can always say, well, I, I hope, you know, I realize you may be too busy for this, but I'd appreciate if, if you couldn't be my mentor, if you might recommend one to me, this is kind of what I'm doing. And don't overthink the first meeting. I mean, yeah. if you get a mentor that's like, you're not organized enough, and you know, then honestly move along because that's not gonna be much fun. Um, but, but I do think respect the fact that when you're dealing with a senior leader, and I wonder sometimes you get, I get like emails from a college student that I, when I was a three-star general, I'd like you to be my mentor. And I'm thinking, yeah, I actually think if I connect you with a 25-year-old, you know, captain who just got into Intel, he or she may have more important things to tell you right now, but I will be happy to find that right person for you. And so just send an email. Don't be afraid of that or walk up to them. And everybody's on LinkedIn. It's the adults Facebook, you know, so. <laughs> I, I just wanted to follow up with that and say, you know, I was always afraid of that initial contact, you know, that contact with them. A, don't be afraid. The worst that's going to happen is they don't respond. Um, and if they don't respond, email them again. Yeah. Because you know what? Sometimes they're just busy. Sometimes they get 500 emails in their email box. And they need that follow-up to say, oh, yeah, I forgot I, I was supposed to contact her. So you know, don't just stop it. And, and you'll know. You'll know if you email three times or four times <laughs> that, OK, they're not interested. You're outside but, their house. But you shouldn't be afraid to do that. <laughs> you should be afraid, because they need that reminder. Um, and so, sorry, I just wanted to I add that. I have two things for you. One is, you know, it doesn't have to be a senior person to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, some of my best mentorship are from the people just a year or two ahead of me who've done the job I've in. In fact, my advice is always, go, get, go talk to somebody who just did the job you're going into. And the second piece of advice is, if you really have somebody and they are you know, a little bit more senior, go talk to their staff. Go talk to their executive assistant. Go talk to people who work for them and say, hey, does he or she, will, do they mentor anybody? Will they, do you think they talk to me? I mean, do your you know, IPB, as we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go uh, Intel go, do the research. Intel preparation of the battlefield. Yeah, I learned I'm it. Gonna, <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Acronym, you know, translator here. 
I think it's also important to remember that um, everyone I've ever asked in my career to help mentor me has been more than enthusiastic to do it because it's a real, it's a real honor to be asked to be a mentor. And so, um, you know, you're, you're giving them a gift to say like, hey, I value your opinion and your perspective. You know, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Don't underestimate like how good that makes people feel. And I don't think it, I don't think it gets old. The, the more you progress in your career, I think people are still flattered by that. So you have a lot of power in that. Yeah, yeah the only other thing I would add, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's asking for uh, a mentor or asking for that other job recommendation and things like that, um, uh, take a step back, take a breath, and realize is kind of a, a little bit, as I was mentioning before, you are strong and powerful and confident, whether you believe it or understand it or not. And it becomes a little bit better with experience um, and over time. But um, uh, I think it was Diet up here earlier saying, you know, kind of do your um, uh, Superman or Superwoman pose and look, talk yourself up in the mirror, whatever it's got to, whatever <laughs> kind of works for you. But um, uh, remember that whether you know it or not, you are stronger than what you may feel um, yep. right now. Very good point. That comes with time, too. Yes. Hi, I'll just speak loudly. Um, Amelia Sharon. You have a microphone right behind you. He go. just wants <laughs> to you. give you that microphone. Amelia Sharenza from the Boeing Company. I'd be curious to hear, carrying forward the theme of you know the two-way street, the mentee and the mentor. Um, I, a lot of times I like to think of it, there are no mentees, everybody's a mentor in some way. Would each of you mind sharing an aha moment or a learning moment that you received from a mentee uh, that made you, made you stop or made you stretch farther? A great question. Um, so General Dynamics has a mentorship pro a formal program. So every year we get paired up with some you know, high potential employees. And my very first one was this young lady and she was down in Miami and I'm up here in DC. So it was kind of difficult to get to know each other, but it was instantly a good click. But she, I mean, I really learned more about her because she was in a job where I didn't know much about what we were doing in the business. So she was constantly teaching me things I needed to know about what's going on. But, but sort of the culmination of this is she went through this process of where she was going to leave and go to the government. And so she called me before she formally told her chain of command or anybody else to talk through this. She said, oh, I got this opportunity. And it was a, it was a great conversation that, that I was you know, just privileged to be a part of it. And she, she, you know, she made her decision. She's very happy with it. But I got so much out of just engaging with her about learning, because I was fairly early in the company, didn't really know what we did in business. And so she's teaching me you know, how we really do the business at the front end. Yeah, so for me, it's, um, uh, I mean, just for me, I'm, I'm a sponge. I love to learn um, about new technologies, new advancements, new emerging initiatives um, going on, particularly within the intelligence community um, uh, and the broader technology environment. Um, but, I, but I'm really more of a, a business operations person, at least right now. Um, the way I, I have really stay, stayed abreast of a lot of the things going on at a pretty relatively um, deeply technical level um, whether it be in the cyber or AI field and things like that, is by engagement with a lot of, in, in sort of a mentor-mentee relationship, or just by engaging very frequently with a lot of people that um, uh, might seek my thoughts or advice on something. But it, it really is a two-way street because I love learning so much from them. And it's really the only way um, that, that I'm going to be able to do that. Um, uh, again, it's not, uh, I can't, um, surround myself with a lot of people very similar like myself. It's got to be with some of those other people um, that know more about these te technical things um, than I do. And it really does help me more than, um, more than they even know. Um, so I always make, take the opportunity to make sure that I um, express my appreciation for that. But um, it really is the awareness that it is a, um, uh, very much a two-way street, uh, mutually beneficial, and that we're both getting um, uh, a lot from those discussions. Uh, and encouraging that and um, setting up time to do that on a more regular basis. I, I would say going back to the idea that everybody has value and it's up to you as a leader to find it. And then rank does not equal brains. Um, one of the most important experiences I had as a brand new battalion commander arriving in Bosnia, which is a weird place to take your battalion, is I had a couple weeks before I would assume command. And um, I was in a cavalry unit, and the cavalry unit, your equipment, you may be great intelligence officers, but if you can't get into position, 
you know, you're, if you're in the motor pool. So I thought I spent a couple of weeks and I would get to know my support sections, my motor pool, my supply rooms. And I went to the senior warrant officer and I said, I'd like you to teach me. I need to go back to school on all this. It's been a long time since I've touched it. Um, I would like you to set me up to talk with everyone in the motor pool and have them teach me their jobs. And I realized I had a specialist who was my supply sergeant, specialist. He was about 22 years old, incredible story, life story, harder story than I could imagine, but this positive person. And we spent a couple hours together where he taught me everything about how he spent all my money, which was the ma major aha moment that this specialist was my center of gravity on my budget, because if he ordered the wrong part, I just bought a tank engine that I didn't need. Um, but that experience of us spending, and I kept coming back because I said, look, I don't want to be, I'm your battalion commander. I never want to be an embarrassment to this motor pool. When I walk around the motor pool, I want all of you to take ownership for what I know. You're going to teach me to be dangerous. I'm going to ask questions that you want these intel people to know. <laughs> A battalion commander knows exactly what we're looking for. And they took ownership of me. And that time spent for the next two years, of me knowing every one of them and their life story and what they were good at and what they meant to our organization taught me everything I needed to know about being a leader in the center of an organization because they took ownership of me. And through that process, I was able to understand what are the decisions you're going to be making in your life that I and the other people in this organization need to help with. So. It was one of those moments that I will, I can see him and I can, you know, the warrant officer was like sort of drifting over to make sure the specialist wasn't getting it wrong. <laughs> but he was so engaged at teaching me everything because he's like, ma'am, you're my lieutenant colonel and I'm going to make sure you have this. That's something that you apply everywhere. And so I'm in Accenture now and I have opportunities to meet designers who don't talk to engineers. And I'm fascinated by the, that difference of, I have a beautiful design, and the engineer's like, and we're never going to be able to do this. <laughs> but, but I'm sitting in the middle of this chaos saying, but something's going to come from here. But that respect for what everybody brings to the entire effort was my aha moment. And people say, how are you successful? And I, I would say that moment with that individual, you know, hearkening back to the lessons you learned at the kitchen table, but applying it in life. Mentors come in every shape or form. That 21, 22 year old made sure his battalion commander at 40 years old never made a mistake in his area ever. Every time I stood in front of that formation, I could lock eyes on him and his entire section. They owned me and I owned them. They were about maintenance excellence and I cared. And that demonstrated a commitment to one another that I just replicated everywhere else in that organization. Because um, candidly, MI soldiers don't re-enlist as often because they have the four times degrees and they're all smarter than you. But those maintenance kids will stay with you forever. So it became one of those. <laughs> you but, invested in each other. <laughs> but I say that to all of you, that your mentors are going to come in many different forms. And you, for the rest of your life, if you treat it correctly, you will seek to be mentored, even at my age, uh, with with people much younger than you, because it's you know, it's all about learning. Okay, so I'm getting kind of the wrap up signal. So what I'm going to do is a quick episode of speed dating right down the line. When you're looking at uh, the names that are in front of you, I think Mary just brought out a great point. Make sure that those names that are on that piece of paper are people you want to build a relationship with and invest in over time, and who are likely to invest back in you. But we have 30 seconds for each of you. Mary, kick off. What should we be doing next for our action plan that we've already started? OK, if you don't have a mentor, this is why you're here. Uh, go forth and, and, and make that attempt. And if you are a mentor, I hope you've listened to all the things that have been said today about how important and impactful you are and, and dedicate yourself and part of your busy days and times to that. You should be, that should be chicken soup to your soul. If you've been lucky enough to be a leader, you have things you can share. And it, all it costs you is time and passion with that individual. Go do it. Nicole, what do you I'd think? I'd say send an email to one of those people on the list, um, just like Mary was saying, um, and, and connect with them soonest, because I think that'll, that's a good action to take out of this. Um, and I would also think about you know, um, what thing can you do in the next meeting that you're in, be it a big you know, corporate meeting or something on client site, where you can help to encourage someone to speak up. Um, what, what opportunity can you give to give someone the floor who maybe is a little bit more shy and reserved and, and have them give them an opportunity to speak up? 
Yeah, the only, the only thing I would add is, to, uh, and, and I'd mentioned a couple points about um, knowing your, your strength, knowing your confidence, and knowing your value. Um, if you haven't done it already, take some time, um, understand uh, the elevator pitch, and understand um, the key things that, um, that make you unique and make you strong, and be able to articulate that. And um, uh, take the time to craft that, understand that, and commit it to memory. And, um, and over time, that becomes sort of contagious to yourself. And, um, uh, and you start to exude that sort of confidence when you really understand, know, and believe in yourself and believe in your value. Mentorship is about relationships. And relationships are everything. But you have to work at it. You have to water those. You have to nurture those relationships. Don't ever let the relationship, unless you want to kill it, but don't ever mm -hmm. let it go. And so make sure, take the time, just an email, just a phone call, or just a note, but, you, but nurture those relationships. Go back to those. I still go back to that young lady that I helped a long time ago and say, hey, how, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Check in on them. Good Thank point. you so much. What a fantastic conversation, a fantastic panel. I love your perspectives. Thank you to Insa and Suzanne and Chesh for bringing this incredible group of people together and allowing this exchange of information. Hopefully it's helpful, and thank you. Wow. It could be. <laughs> Would you like to use mine? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That on? Okay. So yes, I am the old colonel. Okay. <laughs> but I, but I, but I didn't think you thought I was old at the time. That was 23 years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, the one thing I did want to say, and John, thanks for bringing it up, and for all of you for kind of emphasizing it. But the mentorship stuff is not just about senior subordinate. You know, it's it's really about you know finding people that are fortunate to have an experience that you don't. So thanks for bringing that out. I think that's really important. And to emphasize to the junior folks to take the opportunity to do that. But uh, thanks again to our panel. I'm going to ask you guys to, uh, where's Suzanne? She's over there. She's going to give you a little memento off stage. OK. Uh, we're going to reset the stage. I'm going to ask you guys to stay in place uh, here. We're going to reset the stage uh, with a podium. And then we'll get to our final keynote speaker who is the only thing in the way of our wine after that, okay? <laughs> okay, thanks again to our panel.